In the beginning, the foundations of the earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis 1.1. What does that imply? Our next line. I've got a, something I can do something with about it. There we go. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. David, what are we bringing this in for? If we look at this next slide, it says also the fourth commandment. Well, from Genesis 1.1, we want to try to link the phrase in the beginning to something we can know and understand from the New Testament. And it turns out that Jesus' own words in the New Testament help us to put um, a time frame on the phrase in the beginning. But from the beginning, God made them male and female. So if we can link the term in the beginning to the creation of male and female, we've solved one of the big questions in biblical exegesis, and that is exactly when was the earth created? If you believe that the earth was created during creation week, then your answer is solved. And Jesus tends to use that, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. When were Adam and Eve created? In the beginning. Um, I sort of skipped over that pretty quickly. Let's go back. You were explaining it. So what we're doing here is basically attaching Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. We want to believe that exactly as it says. As you said, with now from the beginning. So now we're attaching in the beginning with from the beginning and there at creation week. And it's within the six days of creation. It says everything, all that was in them is heaven, earth, sea, and all that in them is. And so therefore, David, if that is the case, all that in them is, what does that mean about El Capitan? The fourth commandment gives us a clue as to where we're going to be going with our talk tonight. Our postulate, our um, hypothesis is going to be that the earth was specially created along with the plants, the uh, animals, and man himself and herself. And this rock, some of you recognize where this is from, El, El Capitan in Yosemite National Park. There's going to be a contest tonight to see who can tell how many times we're going to show this picture. It's, it, it's going to show up a lot. This is the first time, obviously. But the reason why we're going to show this picture a lot is very simple. And that is, we're trying to get across an idea. The idea is, is that can you identify some of the original created material that God spoke into existence during creation week? Now certainly you can look outside here and you can look at some of the man-made objects and we know for a fact that none of that was part of the original creation. You can even go to places like the Grand Canyon and you know that that probably was not the way it looked at the time of creation. Even El Capitan itself is probably not the way it looked at creation, but the thing that makes El Capitan different than the Grand Canyon is what? El Capitan is an igneous rock, a rock that was formed, as geologists call it, <clears throat> from a melt, a pluton, a gigantic pluton. We're going to look more into details about exactly what we mean by that. Whereas the Grand Canyon is sedimentary rock, rock that was formed by layers of um, sediment piling up on one another, than being cut through by massive action of water, which, which we believe happened during the flood. Well, let's continue here. And, let me and, just uh, um, let me add to that. What David is saying is, as he said very well, this is a rock according to the fourth commandment, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth to see, and all that in them is, that rock has got to be something that God created. So, David? Psalm 33, 6 and 9 speaks to the rapidity with which God spoke the world into existence. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The language of that verse tends to make you think that when God speaks, matter comes into existence. It's not something that takes a long time. The spoken word becomes matter. It's instantaneous. The thought that Jesus can create matter or that God can create matter should not come as a surprise to anyone who uh, believes in the Bible, believes in the miracles of the Bible, but it is an alien thought 
for those who have not really given it too much thought in the past. But uh, you have to understand too that in the creation of this world, in the seven, the six days of creation, God suspended the known physical laws which we can see and register and measure today. All bets are off during creation. You cannot use the things that we measure in the laboratory today as a gauge as to how creation happened. So we're going to be thinking about that too. But the, there's a lot of facets to what we're going to be talking about. And hopefully we'll be able to cover everything that needs to be explained as we move along. But we're going to be actually looking at evidences in the rocks that suggest that they do not fit a uniformitarian model as the evolutionists must have in order for their theory to be correct. Fortunately, our theory, we don't need to abide by uniformitarianism. We have, by nature of the creation model, has in its, uh, at its core the existence of singularities, or in biblical terms, miracles. Look at Romans 4.17. God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Again, God speaks and he calls into existence things that do not exist. David, would it be fair to say that what we believe then with respect to Romans 4.17 and that granite rock, El Capitan, that God spoke and it came into existence? Not only that, that's just a minuscule amount of what was spoken into existence on day one of creation week. Just a minuscule amount, that's true, that's true. But the fact of the matter is, people here in California, if they understand what we're saying tonight, they can go and take a piece or at least look at El Capitan and many of the other granite rocks and they can pick it up and say, oh, this is something that God called into existence. This is what we're getting at to tonight. And then not only in Genesis and in the fourth commandment, but what do we have here in the book of Revelation? Well, for those of us who are Seventh-day Adventists, this verse is very familiar. Not only do we look at Genesis as a guide to tell us about creation in Exodus, in the fourth commandment, we can go all the way to Revelation, Revelation 14, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. It's interesting to note that God chooses to identify himself in the book of Revelation in a very specific way. He wants to identify himself as the God who made heaven and earth and the sea. All of these things God made, and he wants to identify himself as the creator. If we do away with creation, if we somehow water down the biblical view, the biblical model of creation, we're basically undercutting much of the theology upon which we hold our faith to. For those of us who are Adventists, that's a lot, because we believe that Creation is important because God rested the seventh day and gives us a reason to rest each week. If we do away with that, what do we really have? It's, not, it's just going to be a matter of time before people say, you know, if creation isn't true, why are we keeping the Sabbath holy? That doesn't even make any sense. So it's critical that we look carefully at all the evidences we can. And we're going to, you know, we're just talking about the Bible right now, but just hold on. We'll... That's number two, or is that three? I've lost count. So anyway, we're gonna be seeing this rock an awful lot. So if the earth was created by God, there must exist in the beginning rocks. That is, Genesis rocks, the Genesis rocks that God called into existence on day one of creation week, which is what you just got through saying. What and where are they? Well, now we've already said what we think, but we're gonna go a little bit further and now it says, in the beginning and the foundations of the earth. What does it say about this, in the beginning? Sometimes it's nice to go to the Bible and actually try to get some phraseology that helps us put in perspective exactly what we see when we go to the science. And in this case, Hebrews 1.10 uses the phrase 
um, foundations of the earth. Now we're going to actually key in on that a little bit and we're going to look at something <coughs> just a little bit later that actually tries to identify what are the foundations of the earth. The foundation rocks, the, thing, the rocks that actually hold together the framework of the earth. We're going to look at that because in the Bible it says in the beginning, when was in the beginning? From the beginning he made them male and female. We'd like to submit to you that in the beginning actually means creation week. That's not a, something that's, you know, shrouded in mystery here. It's pretty straightforward. In the beginning, you laid the foundations of the earth. When you build a building, what do you start with? You start with the foundation. You start with basically digging a hole and laying the, the foundation. Before the foundation is laid, there's nothing. David, you know, um, for the audience's sake, you heard me introduce, of course, our presentation tonight with me saying, of course, that I was greatly, greatly, greatly confused about this whole issue of age of the earth, orange of the earth, and so forth. But this passage that David has been speaking about here in the beginning, what we're saying is God himself actually identified for the here and now which rocks were the in the beginning rocks, which rocks were actually created. They're specified as those which are the foundations of the earth. And we're going to return to this again. David, uh, there was a drill hole back in the Kola Peninsula. What's that all about? A Science News is just a popular um, news magazine that kind of tries to capture the um, headlines in science. And in this particular article, it's a little bit old now, but the results of it are still valid. The, the article talked about Earth's foundation rocks revealed by a deep drill hole in the Kola Peninsula how, in, how, in David, Russia. How far down did it go? And it went down uh, almost 40,000 feet into the earth, which of course is just a little bit compared to the overall um, radius of the earth or the diameter of the earth, but nevertheless it was deeper than what had originally had ever been drilled before. And in the process of drilling this hole, scientists were actually testing what the results of drilling this hole were, the actual core samples that they were collecting versus what the theory, scientific theory, was predicting would be at those depths. And it's interesting to note that the, or the article just says, we can just read it, geologists are often interested in studying the hard crystalline rocks that form the foundation of all continents. According to theory, the crust resembles a layer cake with sedimentary rock layers on top, acidic granite top, granite type rocks on the bottom. Now that's the theory. When the drill actually reached a depth of seven and a half kilometers or over almost 40,000 feet, um, the scientists did not find basaltic rock. The Soviets now believe that if the basaltic layers exist, they must lie much deeper. Kohler revealed how far from truth scientific theory can roam. What they're basically saying is they thought they were going to hit granite rocks right away and then go down into basaltic rocks, which is a secondary rock. But it turns out it was granite, granite, granite down 40,000 feet. That's why they said the granitic foundation rocks. So we're saying that indeed by geological drilling into the earth, geology has actually affirmed experimentally that indeed the granite rocks are the skeletal framework, so to speak, just like our bones are, of course, for our bodies. The granite rocks are the skeletal rocks, so to speak, of all the continents, truly the foundation rocks. And again, our favorite mountain, so to speak, hill, what do we want to call it? Monolith, El Capitan, special significance. Well, if indeed those are foundation rocks, if the earth was formed, remember we said, by, by creation, then we had in the beginning and what we just read about the foundations of the earth. But now we're saying, if the earth, however, was formed by evolutionary processes, then... There must exist rocks that formed naturally by cooling slowly over the presumed long ages of geological time. What and where are they? So we're aiming toward this contrast between something that was created and something that evolved slowly. And what are the geologists saying about that? Interesting, there are some, some similarities. Geologists claim to know which rocks form naturally by slow cooling and what they claim is the multi-billion year age of the earth. They postulate, again now, hard crystalline rocks such as granites are those rocks. It is the linchpin of all the theory of evolution. Now we really need to understand what we're getting at here. See, the evolutionists are saying that